So I just saw Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Not to be confused with the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, or the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, or even Texas Chainsaw. No, I'm actually talking about the new Netflix movie that came out this Friday. You probably haven't heard about it, because aside from the trailer, which dropped about two months ago, Netflix really hasn't promoted the movie at all. It's almost like they don't want anyone to see it. Oh! Before we get into that though, here's some help with the timeline. You know, in case you're confused about where this movie fits into the Texas Chainsaw Cinematic Universe. Coming soon to Netflix. Texas Chainsaw Massacre is a direct sequel to THE Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Much like Halloween 2018, this movie sort of resets the timeline and mostly ignores any sequels or reboots. This is actually pretty common practice for the TCM franchise at this point. Texas Chainsaw 3 ignored Texas Chainsaw 2. Next Generation basically reboots things again and plays as a direct sequel to the original. Texas Chainsaw 3D reboots things yet again and creates another timeline from the original. Leatherface is a prequel to that sequel reboot and serves as some sort of origin story. Then there's the 2003 The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which starts a completely new timeline and was successful enough to get a prequel that serves as another sort of origin story to Leatherface. Whew. For this new quasi-sequel reboot set decades after the original, four young hip influencers looking to breathe new life into a Texas ghost town using TikTok encounter Leatherface, the legendary killer who is known to possess superpowers such as super strength and fast travel warping. He also cannot die, no matter what. This review will contain spoilers, but you can skip to this time code to get a spoiler-free conclusion of sorts. Though if you saw the trailer for this movie, you pretty much got it already. The first thing people were talking about when the trailer dropped was Sally, and the obvious parallels to Lori in Halloween 2018. This movie does borrow the idea of taking in an iconic final girl from an iconic 70s slasher series, aging her up a bit, and giving her PTSD. But it turns out that this movie is also similar to Halloween Kills in a lot of ways as well. Evil dies tonight! Evil dies tonight! The angry hate mob is replaced by insufferable hipster influencers, though they serve the same purpose at the end of the day, which is, you know, to die. <laughs> But where Texas Chainsaw Massacre really sticks close to the Halloween Kills playbook is when it takes the idea of the survivor living with trauma and throws it away before anything interesting can be explored. It almost felt like a parody of Halloween Kills when Sally shows up to save the day only to prove to be useless. I'm the one who got away, and I'm here to make sure you don't. To the point that I thought for a second that this was going to be a black comedy of sorts. More likely though, it's just a cash grab that is trying to capitalize on the success of Halloween 2018 while thoughtlessly dumping in as many social issues and buzzwords as possible to come off as relevant. Who has such a small dick they need to walk around in public with a fucking gun? Like, behold the joys of late stage capitalism. Anyone who blasts diesel into the atmosphere like that truly gives zero fucks about like anything. Try anything and you cancel, bro. Unfortunately, there isn't any substance to it, and I found it really hard to care about any of the characters as a result. Aside from the script, they were easily the worst part of this movie. There isn't too much to say here. These aren't really characters. The lead is played by Elsie Fisher, who I knew from 8th grade. There's an attempt at an arc with her character, but you'll see it coming from a mile away. The second we learned that she was shot, I immediately thought, oh, it's gonna talk about school shootings now. Mm -hmm. And the second that was confirmed, I thought, oh, she's gonna have to overcome her fear and use a gun to stop Chainsaw Man. And then sure enough, she does, and she even seems to love it. Who's the active shooter now, bitch? <laughs> it's all pretty transparent, and it lacks any depth. It's as tasteless and generic as it gets. Each character feels randomly generated from some list of attributes and buzzwords. And they all die off before we get to learn much about them, which is the MO for slasher movies, I know. But what keeps this from clearing that low bar for me is that these characters make bad decisions so that the movie can happen, which again, is the MO for slashers, I, I know but I wouldn't mind having at least a little logic behind it. This would make them feel more like people and less like a writer rushing towards a paycheck. Show me the deed to that house. You'll have them back. Why? I'll never relax until I'm sure we're on the right side of this. Why? 
Your character thus far has been comically cold and dismissive to the locals. Why the sudden 180? I'm going with her. No, 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 no. I'll, I'll go with her. I'll go. When she wakes up in the hospital, do you really think she'll find comfort in seeing the person responsible for taking her from her home? You look down here, I'll check upstairs. Okay, actually why though, right? What difference does it make? And if the house still does belong to her, how does rummaging through her belongings help to make the situation better? It's all an excuse to get the characters inside the house for when Leatherface fast travels back to meet them. I get it, but it all felt a little too forced for me. At least in the original, you could understand why a person, you know, a human being with thoughts and reason would enter that house. He needed gas and heard someone who may be in need of help. Her boyfriend never came out of the house. Is he okay? His friends are missing. Hey, it's their blanket on the porch. Maybe they're inside. This may seem like a nitpicky thing to fault the movie for, but this movie is full of them. And by the end, it accumulates so many that you realize it's just lazy writing. Enter, fuckers. Often you feel like you're listening to the writer talk instead of the characters, and at times I felt like it had to be on purpose. <laughs> For example, there is no way the writers didn't know how unlikable this character was. They even shit on her at one point. It's like they're winking at the audience saying like, yeah, we, we know. Had they leaned into stuff like that way more and gone over the top with it a bit, it could have worked more as a black comedy. But it doesn't really ever get there, so I'm not sure what to make of it at the end. It certainly wasn't scary. In fact, I felt more tension watching Bo Burnham's 8th grade. Like, no joke. <laughs> Truth or dare. Compared directly to the other Texas Chainsaw entries, this is probably the most clean looking. Leatherface has been living a peaceful life and presumably isn't in the business of killing and eating people anymore, so a lot of the grime and grit you'd expect from a Texas Chainsaw set is missing. The cinematography is pretty good, but it's almost too calculated at times. It wasn't bad or anything, there are some nice frames within frames at times which I liked, but I think it would have helped to be more claustrophobic and a little less slick looking throughout. Part of what made the original so effective was its low budget documentary feel. That's obviously not what this movie was going for though, and that's fine, but the movie lacks a real edge regardless. It doesn't ever feel like you're watching a hellish fever dream really, and the townsfolk aren't deranged weirdos, unless you count Sally. <laughs> the chaotic and confusing nightmare world the Texas Chainsaw movies are known for is gone, and as a result, so too is the atmosphere. There was one set piece that I thought had potential to be tense, but they didn't really do much with it. It would have been pretty tense at night too if we didn't already know that Leatherface was gone at this point. He'd already teleported back to the town to launch his TikTok career. Any scene that might have been tense is immediately cut short when Leatherface shows up anyway. If you saw my review for Halloween Kills, you'll know that I had a similar problem with that movie. Basically, if you're a fan of horror movies for the gore and just want to see the killer looking cool as he kills these annoying characters, you'll probably enjoy the movie just fine. Unfortunately for everyone else, there isn't much to latch onto here. The effects were mostly pretty good, but sometimes they took me out of the movie a little. I mean, cool, but how did he do that, you know? At first I thought this doesn't make sense. You know, how did he throw it in there when he's over there? But maybe in the next prequel, we learn that Leatherface was once a promising young pitcher, known for his wicked curveball. His career was cut short thanks to an injury, and the resentment led to a life of crime. So do I recommend the Texas Chainsaw Massacre? Yes. Toby Hooper made an awesome little horror movie, and I would also recommend the sequel, especially if you're a fan of Resident Evil 7. Uh, do I recommend Texas Chainsaw Massacre? Well, not really. No. The writing alone easily ranks this one lower on the Texas Chainsaw tier list, and beyond some fun effects and gore, there isn't much else to take away from it. The best part of this new sequel reboot is that Netflix was kind enough to send me this reminder to cancel my membership after it had finished. Thanks, Netflix. Look, I'm, I'm pretty hardcore. I mean, I've been known to do a number on plenty of cats. Do a number? Yeah, I bet you do a number. In your tights, on Broadway. Which is where you moved to after you left Texas Chainsaw Mascara, where you're from.
What's he talking about?